mirror configurations was mind blowing to me. And then just like some of the other dirds, it gets even more mind blowing. So let's start with mirror configurations. At the simplest level, a mirror configuration consists of a pair of Hemholtz coils with current flowing in the same direction. I have been saying that what's happening to the plane is a magnetic wormhole. Do you know what they use for magnetic wormholes? Hemholtz coils. Literally, they use Hemholtz coils. In fact, I'm arguing that the, the orbs are creating a Hemholtz coil around the airplane. Around the airplane. And what he's saying here is that the same idea is being used in the orbs themselves. So just like I've been saying is that essentially you're looking at a cylindrical device, a cylindrical device of rings, a cylindrical device of rings that causes current to flow through the middle of it, where we're going to see our x-rays shooting out. And through this process, it creates this plasma bubble around the object and keeps that plasma in an equilibrium state. I better just keep reading this. Uh, magnetic field intensity varies along B with a minimum uh, value B at the middle and maximum at the coil location. Confinement in the simplest mirror configuration is described by the conservation of energy and of the first adiabatic invariant. Now, who wrote that paper about adiabatic compression? Uh, David Kirkley, CEO of Helium Fusion. Adiabatic invariant of a particle of mass moving in a weakly inhomogeneous magnetic field. Charged particles spiral around the B field lines at a distance called the Larmor radius. The Larmor radius. These conservation laws imply that the particle moving along with field velocity V is reflected at the plasma location. So here's our image. This is actually from the thumbnail. So what does this look like? Literally just rings and the plasma is flowing through the rings. And you can see that because there is separation between the rings, that's where it gets bulky. It gets bulky between the rings. So just like you would imagine a fluid flowing through magnetic fields, it looks that's exactly what it looks like. Very simple mirror configuration right there. Therefore, upon producing a magnetic field configuration, such as that was shown above here, particles will be trapped. They're going to be trapped. So what happens is that particles enter this magnetic field configuration and they get trapped inside. You want to know the real rub related to this? Any particle that falls into this gets trapped inside. So this is really interesting because this, yeah, this is like, it's almost exactly the same as Helium's fusion reactor. And here's the other rub. When I was reading about Lockheed Martin's compact fusion reactor, this is also how it was described. It was described as concentric rings using a field reverse configuration. So it's not just Helium Energy doing this. Lockheed Martin is sitting on a secret field reverse configuration fusion reactor that uses the exact same concepts. So then they do the math on the trapping ratio, which is the so-called mirror ratio. Particles not satisfying this condition will be promptly lost with the result of producing an anisotropic distribution function characterized by a loss cone in velocity space. So the idea is that a lot of this stuff is going to get trapped inside. It says, obviously, the fraction of unconfined particles can be made smaller if they are injected in the configuration with a small parallel velocity. So... What they do here, then, if they don't want particles to fly out of this, then you control the injection of your neutral beam injectors. So how do they keep the fusion going? They have these neutral beam injectors that basically just keep it spinning. You can imagine from the simplest perspective, how do you keep the swing pushing? You have these neutral beam injectors. So if you inject them at the right velocity, then they're also going to get trapped inside this spinning mesh of plasma. So since electrons have higher collision velocity than ions, they are scattered in the loss cone at a higher rate. At a, as a consequence, the plasma tends to be positively charged. Its potential is determined by the condition that transport must be amb uh, ambipolar, yielding values in the range of, I think this is, is that, uh, I don't know what that that uh, character is there, if that's te if temperature or not. 
If the electron temperature is too low, the slowing down of injected ions by the electrons occurs on a fast time scale. Thus, electrons must be kept at, at sufficiently high temperature. I thought this was odd because we have to keep the temperatures at high levels. And he argues in here that the temperatures of the electrons is actually lower than what the classical interpretation would, would claim. I might be saying that a little bit wrong, but that's, I think, the main idea of what he says here. It says, to achieve a high electron temperature in an open-ended configuration might appear to be a slightly diff difficult task, since configurations based on classical fluid transport theory would predict very high electron thermal conduction. However, in experiments characterized by low collisionality, the electron thermal conductivity along the magnetic field lines is much lower than the classical estimate. This result is a consequence of the presence of this ambipolar potential that confines the electrons inside the mirror. Only suprathermal non-equilibrium electrons can escape the barrier and contribute to thermal conduction. This has the effect of a dramatic reduction in thermal electron conductivity at the expense of low plasma density and thus large size of the device. What this sounds like to me when I read this is that your plasma is going to get really dense and it's not going to heat up as much as you thought. As long as you control it with your magnetic field lines, your plasma is going to potentially become relatively stable and it's not going to get super hot. I mean, it's still going to get hot from a relative perspective, but not hot in the perspective of we need fusion to happen hot. That's how I interpreted that. Could be wrong. That's my interpretation. So there are some instabilities. There's a bunch of instabilities. And when I read through the instabilities, one of the most common ways to cure the instabilities is actually just spin. Introducing spin into your object actually fixes a bunch of the instabilities, which I thought was interesting in general. Um, let's go to the tandem mirror setup. Skip to the tandem mirror setup. So this is the one that I think the we get progressively more complex in these ideas. And I think they build onto each other. They kind of build onto each other. The tandem mirror setup, when I looked at the image here, which you see on your screen, it actually looks more accurate to what I expect we would see in the MH370 videos in the orbs. The orbs I expect are a long tube with a pinch on either end, much like the tandem mirror. But it might even get more complicated than this. If Paul Sizz was writing about this in textbooks back in the 2000s, then we probably had everything that he's been writing about. The military probably had everything he's already been writing about. And why was he allowed to write about this? Because literally no one believed it. Literally no one believes any of the stuff that he's writing. I, I actually think the number of people that understood what he was writing about here is like you could probably count it on one hand. The idea behind the tandem mirror is to modify the electrostatic potential shape along the B field in such a way to confine both escaping electrons and ions. So we just talked about these electrons are escaping our trap that we built. We built this mirror trap to confine our electrons. And now they're saying we can actually do a better job if we use this, this tandem mirror configuration. So in the tandem mirror, two smaller mirror cells are added at each end of the larger central cell where the fusion reactions are supposed to take place. The axial profiles of density and temperature of the two end cells are tailored using external methods such as radio frequency heating and neutral beam injection so as to transform them into positive potential electrostatic plugs, thus reducing the loss of positive ions from the central cell. The axial profiles of density, temperature, and electrostatic potential are shown. So what are we saying here? The most simple level, we're saying that we are we are plugging up our mirror. We've got our cylindrical mirror. Now we're going to plug it up with some more mirrors. So that if things try to escape out these sides, they're going to get reflected back towards the middle. That's pretty much what we're saying here. So we're saying we're going to basically confine our fusion reaction using plasma mirrors or any mirrors. Because what do mirrors do? They reflect. They reflect the light. They reflect energy. And then it shows, I couldn't really understand these graphs. Maybe you guys will understand them better here. But it says standard tandem mirror versus thermal barrier tandem mirror. And it shows the magnetic field strength. It shows the electron density 
Uh, and then it mentions hot ions here. We've talked about hot ions before, but I still don't fully understand them. That may be something I dig into a little bit more. And then the last one is the plasma potential. It says axial profiles in the tandem mirror. Uh, the illustration is showing a comparison between the density and electrostatic potential profile in a standard tandem mirror versus a tandem mirror with a thermal barrier. So it says, since the density in the cell must be sufficiently high to reach large fusion density, very high values of plug density are in order. And this implies a very high magnetic field in the end cells and high energy neutral beam injection. So here you go. This might be the first time that we've actually seen numbers in here. What kind of Tesla do we need in order to achieve our plasma fusion? Greater than 15. Greater than 15 Tesla. Greater than 15 Tesla is really high, guys. In fact, this is now starting to make me understand how we only figured this technology out in the 2000s because we simply didn't have the superconducting magnets that were required to achieve Teslas above like 15. But now, as of 2005 or so, we have been able to achieve these magnetic field strengths. So we needed these high magnetic field strengths, and now we have them. Now we can produce them. In fact, when you see these wars going on over, what are they called, the rare earth materials, minerals, they're usually talking about things that we're producing, that we're using to make superconducting magnets like this. There you go. And we also need high energy beam injection. So not only, so instead of lasers, instead of using laser confinement, we're using this neutral beam injector. So we have to add energy into our system. As long as we're constantly adding this energy, then we're going to keep this thing going. That's the basic idea here. There you go. Let's see. It says, therefore, electrons in the plug are in thermal contact with electrons in the central cell. Any attempt to increase the temperature in the plug will increase the temperature in the central cell. So one of the downsides is you need to build like a barrier here. So if you build a barrier, then what happens is that like you kind of separate the temperature out. The problem with what they were saying in this part is that even the plug will heat up. And when the plugs heat up, then it's going to heat up the rest of the system or vice versa. So you separate the plugs. They have their own thermodynamic setup and they're separated from everything else. It is apparent that in order to maintain this configuration, external power must be injected into the two end cells. On the other hand, if the volume of the end cells is sufficiently smaller than the volume of the central cell, the contribution to the global energy balance of the energy cells is negligible and large Q becomes feasible. So this is the part where I think I'm pretty all in now on the orbs must have something inside a lot of people have tried to claim that the orbs have nothing inside of them that they're freely plasma balls that have no configuration this tells me that you have to be injecting energy into these plasma orbs in order for them to maintain their shape that's what i'm, I'm hearing here even if it's a very small amount of energy you have to inject some energy which means there has to be something inside of them there must be something inside of them Something is managing the plasma, essentially, on the inside. Okay. And this is something, some kind of Japanese configuration. We're going to skip the Japanese configuration thing. Um, it talks about magnetic nozzles. Okay, I think this is in the field reverse configuration. Okay, now let's go to field reversed mirror. You should recognize the image on the screen right now because that is a field reverse configuration. This is literally what helium fusion is doing right there. There it is. You're looking at it on the screen. That's the field reverse configuration. In a field reverse mirror, plasma confinement is achieved by producing a ring current of electric particles. If the current in the ring is sufficiently large, field reversal occurs and a napkin ring shaped configuration is produced with a closed magnetic field lines confining the plasma. This concept was pioneered by the Astron device in 1979, where field reversal was attempted with a beam of particles characterized by orbit sized characterized by orbit size comparable with device dim uh, dimensions the field reverse mirror has a great deal in common with compact tori configurations and therefore will be discussed later okay chat where is the clip where is it where are you at dokes how come i don't have my do oh there is Um, when I read uh, Compact Tori chat, 
What do you guys think that compact tori means? Having a sip of my coffee here while the chat responds. The field reverse mirror has a great deal in common with compact tori configurations and therefore will be discussed later. Any thoughts? Nobody knows yet. I'm looking at the chat. Interesting. Interesting chat. Okay, I'm going to leave it as a spoiler. Let's see. We're going to we're going to skip ahead a little bit. So, we've got this gas dynamic mirror. I think I'm going to skip the gas dynamic mirror option, but the idea here is that we add a gas and we trap the gas inside, which actually I think is really similar to what Salvatore Pais was saying where we use this monoatomic gas. Up, oh, somebody got it. Somebody got it. EVOs. There it is, EVOs. 